While you're waiting for us to get started in the next couple of minutes, feel free to grab a snack or a notepad. There's also a workbook, hi Kamara. There's a workbook that goes along with today's webinar workshop. So um, if you haven't already gotten a chance, while you're waiting, while you're waiting for us to get started in the next couple of minutes, feel free to grab there's a weird echo happening there. Yeah, but um we do have a workbook that goes along with this presentation today. So if you wanted to follow along in that workbook, it was sent in the email. I'll also place a link to it in the chat box um, for folks tuning in so you can go in and follow along that way. All right, I see some more folks are joining us and it is exactly seven o'clock Eastern time, but uh, six o'clock your time. So we're gonna go ahead and get started with our workshop. Hi everyone, welcome. My name is Brandi Keeler. I am Assistant Director of Admissions at the College for Creative Studies. We are an art and design college located in Detroit, Michigan. And today I'm really, really excited for our workshop on Ikigai, which is a concept that we'll learn a lot about shortly, but it's mostly how to find and pursue your unique path as a creative person to make a difference in the world with your creativity. So as part of this workshop, I was speaking about this earlier, there is a workshop, a workbook uh, with some worksheets that you can use to follow along and also start to brainstorm using the advice that I give in today's presentation, okay? So we're gonna get started. I will turn off my camera. Um, just so that you all can focus on the visuals because we are our school. We love our visuals. So I'm going to turn off my camera and go ahead and get started with Ikigai. So if you've never heard of the term Ikigai before, that's okay. It's not a, a English term. It's actually a Japanese term, meaning a reason for being. It's the reason why you wake up in the morning, excite what you get to do for a living. It's what makes life worthwhile. Another way that this word has been used is it's someone's purpose in life. And as somebody who's really passionate about helping people find their purpose and pursue their highest calling, I spent the last decade mentoring and coaching and advising students and adults on how to pursue and identify their creative purpose. And working in admissions at CCS for the past four years, I've had thousands of conversations with students about the unique difference that they want to make in the world using their creativity. But before I get into the details of how to identify and pursue your Ikigai, I want to talk to you really quickly about why this matters in the first place, right? Many folks have heard of the 80,000 hours theory. I don't know if anybody on this uh, webinar today have heard of it, but this is the theory that we spend 80,000 hours of our lives in our career, right? We spend a lot of time in our adult lives committed to something that we're doing, right? And as a young adult, as a high school student, figuring out what you want to do for the rest of your life at seven or 18, even 20 years old, could be a really daunting and intimidating task, right? And then you add to that task the assignment of choosing a college major to not only study, but invest four years of your life and thousands of dollars to pursue. And that list of choices can become really overwhelming really quickly, right? Um, in fact, according to the National Center for Education Statistics, about 80% of students in the U.S. end up changing their major at least once right? Which ends up adding more years to one's college degree path. It ends up costing students more money to sometimes pursue college because they're changing their mind midway through. And that can end up making more student debt, right? So Ikigai is a concept that's not only helpful for figuring out your purpose, but it's really helpful in the college education process because it can provide you with more clarity and more confidence about the major that you're pursuing. And because you feel more clarity and confidence about that major, it can oftentimes actually end up saving you time and money in the long run, long run when it comes to college, right? So you're attending school, doing something that you know is a great fit for you based on Ikigai. So let's get into it. Let's talk about what an Ikigai is for you. Your Ikigai lies at the intersection of four questions. Is what do I love to do? What am I good at? 
What do I feel the world needs and what can I get paid to do, right? If you're pursuing something that only answers one or two of those questions, it is not an eco guy. For example, I know so many students who say, I love art and I wanna get paid, I don't wanna be starving. And they focus on that only, that's a profession. That is not an eco guy, right? Or there are people who say, I love creativity and what I feel the world needs is my unique voice, but they haven't quite figured out how to monetize that, right? So you really want to have something that is this star here is answering all four of those questions, right? Because the problem is, if you aren't doing that, you could look up at 40 and be comfortable in your profession, but feel unfulfilled and feel empty because you're not doing something that, you know, you love, right? Or you can have excitement in your work because you're doing something that you're getting paid to do and feel the world needs. But because you may not be as strong at that, if it's something you're not good at, you may feel an a sense of uncertainty if there's guaranteed job security in that, in that area for you, right? Or like I mentioned earlier, you know, that satisfaction that you're doing something you're good at and getting paid to do, but you're not making a difference in the world. So you feel purposeless in that way, right? And there are a lot of people who are doing this, right? They feel happy and fulfilled, but they can't pay the bills with what they love, right? Those are the people who are singing on the side or painting on the side. We don't want that for you. And that's what that's not what CCS is about, right? We believe there is a way for you to pursue your creativity and meet all four of these needs, right? So what I'm going to do now is actually, before we start to explore your eco guy, I'm going to share some examples with you of alumni from CCS, from College for Career Studies, who have followed their eco guy. And then I'm going to help you explore yours based on how we were able to help them to do the same at CCS. So be sure you're following along with your workbook. I'm going to start off with Todd Smith, who studied graphic design or communications design at CCS. I'm actually going to read a direct quote from him about pursuing his path. He says, for as long as I can remember, there have always been two constants in my life, art and sport. In school, I was constantly yelled at for drawing too much in class. And regardless of the weather, I was always outside kicking, throwing, or chasing a ball around. Eventually, I realized my passions could become a career and that Nike could be a destination, a perfect destination for me to pursue both of them at the same time. So after graduating from College for Creative Studies in Detroit, I moved to Oregon and made my goal a reality. Simple as that, really. 19 plus years later, I'm still here chasing after my original childhood passions day in and day out. Lucky me. So in his work as a senior designer for global footwear equipment at Nike, Todd has led teams of designer responsible for designing soccer balls, shin guards, goalie gloves. He mentors young artists. So he knew since he was a kid that he loved soccer and art. He knew that he wanted to have a job where he was in, involved in these loves. And at CCS, we helped him become good at innovation and design, where he's able to make change in the world as a creative leader. Veronica Scott is another great example. She actually discovered her Ikigai during her junior year at CCS while she was studying product design. I'm actually gonna play a video of her explaining how she discovered the difference she wanted to make in the world through a classroom assignment here at CCS. You know, this all started off as a class project out of College for Creative Studies here in Detroit. And I was studying product design at the time and, and ended up getting my degree in product design, so no fashion background and no experience in sewing. And this was a class project out of a studio. And the whole point of the studio was to design to fill actual needs rather than design pretty shiny, fast things that ended up becoming trash and how to actually fill needs with products. And so I ended up spending a lot of time on the streets in this area, uh, specifically in a shelter called NSO. Having the people on the streets be a part of the design process became really important. And then eventually realizing that the coat itself didn't really matter. It, because really a coat is a band-aid for a bigger, more systemic issue. And I only realized that when going back to the shelter with this finished coat sleeping bag, and at the time it was, wasn't exactly the sleekest thing in the world, going back to the shelter with this coat, there was a woman that actually ended up yelling at me. And she's saying, you know, we don't need coats, we need jobs. And she was entirely correct, because a coat, like I said, on its own, doesn't amount to much, but it has far more impact when it can affect the people in the community in a way of not just giving them something, but helping them stay employed and really employ the people that were gonna receive the coat in the first place. When I first came to the empowerment plan, 
I, you know, was homeless at the time. And I, now I see a lot of people with the coat on and I tell them, I stop and tell them I'm happy to see it on them. And I made that coat, you know, I'm with the company that makes it and they thanks me. They said, you know, it's really warm and it's like, wow. So, you know, it's a blessing. I look at it as a great blessing. We only hire from shelters because one, usually the people inside of those shelters are pretty much blacklisted from a lot of other jobs. And they're really not valued as much as they should be. And as seen as somebody that can learn and grow and rise to a challenge and come out the other side even stronger than when they started. So we hire for multiple different reasons, but these are the people that are not normally given that chance to apply for jobs. And I go in there saying, this is your opportunity for a clean slate. One of the things I enjoy the most is seeing the transition someone makes when they first start with us to the person they really are. You know, everyone we hire is kind of in a survival mode. They're not sure where they're sleeping at night. They're not sure where their next meal is gonna come from. They're not positive about any of that. So they're living kind of from moment to moment. And they're still also out there looking for jobs and looking for employment, ways to get in money. And that person has pushed all of their actual personality, who they are, down so much to just survive and to take care of their family. And so seeing somebody come in and they're always very quiet, and I can tell you this is the same for everyone on here, you know, you don't, you're like, oh, everybody's so quiet. We're getting, they're very dedicated to the job. They want to prove that they're not going to fail, that they're worth it, that, you know, it was worth taking a risk on them. And I don't think of it as a risk. I think of it as a great investment in someone. And so they're so quiet. And then a couple months as we go on and as we give them that opportunity to make mistakes and not have it be the end of the world or the end of their job, they start to open up a lot more. And then the personalities come out. And then the hair gets done and the nails and the clothes. And all of a sudden, there is this person again with an identity that is theirs and not in survival mode. You know, never in a million years did I think that a class project I did while going to school it would ever become a business, let alone anything that actually had a real lasting effect on anybody. To know that the women feel more stable and that they can offer and provide a better life for their kids, that they know where they're going to sleep at night, that know they can feed and clothe their children, that they're going to have a meal ready for them when they come home from school, and know that they can get them to school are all things I'm so happy and, and I wouldn't have even believed years ago if you told me that I could have done. So that's how Veronica discovered her Ikigai at CCS. And that business she started, the apartment plan, start with just three workers and has rapidly grown to now over 30,000 coats being distributed to people across the world in need. And the organization has had more than 65 hires who have been moved into stable housing after six weeks of working in this company, right? So she's really changing the world. She actually is the youngest person to receive the JFK New Frontier Award, which is awarded by the JFK Library and Harvard University. She's really changing the world using her art and her creativity and doing what she loves to do. It was all started off. Sorry about that. Next is Rachel Elise Thomas. She's a documentary photographer and collage artist who uses her art to explore African-American life, culture, and tradition. Being a collage artist and editorial photographer has given her the versatility to tell stories in a lot of different ways. With her personal work, she assembles imagery and materials in a way that encourages the viewer to take a deeper look at the messages she's sharing, messages revolving around identity, ancestry, spirituality, overconsumption, vanity, materialism, colorism, sexism, racism, and more. To date, she has been published by the New York Times, the New Republic, Rolling Stone Magazine, The Marshall Project, InStyle, and countless other publications. And Rachel says she finds great satisfaction in exhibiting her work as well, and has been fortunate to be a part of two fellowships and two artist residencies. So she's spanning the spectrum from commercial photography to documentary photography to fine art collage work, and it's all making a difference. Wendy Frau is an American Dow artist and sculptor and puppet maker who graduated from CCS with her degree in craft and material studies. She's best known for her work fabricating Yoda for the 1980s film Star Wars The Empire Strikes Back. Yes, she made that puppet. And she's been referred to the mother of Yoda because of this. But she worked on other films like Dark Crystal and Labyrinth shortly after graduating when she was designing puppets for Jim Henson. She 
been making dolls though since she was six years old. She's always loved fantasy stories and fairies. This is something that's not new to her, right? That love, but she learned how to become better at making 3D art, right? Through her degree at CCS. And when she was asked her advice for a life well lived, her advice was to find something that you truly believe in and wish to share with the world. And that's exactly what she's doing. And yes, she is paid as a puppet maker and doll artist, so much so that she owns her own castle in England. So she's balling. <laughs> Next is Jason Maiden, who grew up obsessed with Jordan shoes and Michael Jordan as his icon. He also loved his art classes growing up. So it was a, that love between sports and art again. And this video I'm going to play explains how he explored and discovered his ikigai. You have to be comfortable in the skin that you're in because by you being comfortable with your dream, you allow someone else to have their dream. Before becoming a co-founder and CEO of a Silicon Valley startup, Jason Maiden spent over a decade at Nike. He approaches design like the athletes he worked with, constantly practicing his craft, training in the off season, and staying ready for game time. Here's how he got here. My upbringing in Chicago um, informed my design craft because of being industrious, being communicative, being creative was just in the fabric and DNA of people on the South Side. Growing up, we heard stories of Michael Jordan shooting a thousand free throws a day. Michael, is what he's done is he's been able to get to the free throw line, he's six of six. I applied that same cadence and discipline to my craft. From freshman year all the way up until now, I typically try to average about a thousand sketches a day. I'm constantly moving my hand to make sure that I'm in that rhythm so that when I'm called into the game like Michael, I'm already ready to go. Everyone assumes that, you know, I succeeded on my first try to get into Nike. Um, unfortunately, I did not. I was rejected three times and it hurt, but you brought up the wound and it's so soon. And, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but once I got there, I had the good fortune of being Nike's first African-American design intern. I worked on everything from lace tips to a shoe called the AJ-17 Mule that went to production. And by the end of my um, internship experience, I was given a full-time role. So I went back to CCS in Detroit where I was studying industrial design and then I went back to fulfill that full-time role. Throughout my 14 years of being at Nike, I went from being an intern to an executive, and I did everything from branding for athletes to strategy to understanding supply chain, working on everything from soft goods to software, from footwear to firmware. I threw myself into the business fully because I wanted to learn. Along my journey in design, I had always desire to advocate for the creative voices that weren't present in the room when business decisions were being made. So I went and I applied for business school at Stanford Graduate School of Business. When I was working at Nike, I knew that I had a gift for working with athletes and working on physical product. It wasn't until I came to Stanford that I discovered that my process and how I thought was actually my true skill. And that was transferable to any industry. I've had the great fortune in my career to work with legends and icons such as Michael Jordan himself, Derek Jeter, um, Carmelo Anthony, Chris Paul, Eminem, Russell Westbrook. It was a tremendous experience that broadened what I believed were my opportunities in the world. You know, most innovation is born from unfortunate circumstances. My son, you know, had developed um, a health condition that made him not love who he was. And as any father would do, you put everything on the line for your family. So I walked away from my dream job. I went back to Stanford, worked as a researcher at the D School and found solutions to help my son. And then I fell upon this idea. Super Heroic is a company that focuses on what we call multimodal play. So it's essentially trying to reinvent the way children interact with the built environment and the world in which they live. Some of the skills that I find very applicable and helpful in the design industry is the willingness to persist in the face of ambiguity. It's critically important that we run towards those question marks because that's where we find discoveries and breakthroughs and innovations that can change the world and change society. The lesson I would tell students is that no one is expecting you to be perfect, but people expect for you to be disciplined. Discipline is what wins games. The Chicago Bulls have won their sixth NBA championship. Discipline is what makes the difference between someone who succeeds and someone who doesn't. Also, be patient. You know, so many of us are pushed to succeed rapidly. There are no such thing as an overnight success. There are people who've been in motion for years and we're just seeing the end result. So be patient with yourself, be patient with your process, always stay learning, and you'll have a very fruitful, enjoyable life and career.
So that's Jason Maiden pursuing his ikigai. And when people are passionate about their profession, it also makes a difference. They get noticed, right? Jason's been featured on multiple most inspiring lists, including Fast Company's 100 Most Creative People in Business and Ebony's Power 100 list. In fact, he's the entity behind Jason Maiden Day in Austin, Texas, which is March, 7, March 17th. So let's talk about what you can do to start to explore your, your ikigai, right? How do you answer the very first question? What do you love to do? This is pre pretty much the easiest question to answer, right? You look at your current hobbies, what you do in your spare time, what your personal interests are. You also can take a look at your favorite classes or school groups, right? If you're always eager to get to your art classes, that's probably a sign it's something you love to do, right? You can also think back to childhood, like Wendy Froud, she was making dolls at six. Ask yourself, when you were a much younger child, what did you love doing or thinking about, right? That may be a hint at what you love to do. Also ask yourself, what do you do without people telling you to do it? I think about the students who only draw in their art classes what their teachers tell them to draw versus the kids who are filling up sketchbooks when no one's telling them to do that. It's just something they love to do, right? Or taking photos because they love doing it. And if you aren't sure exactly what you love or you love a lot of things and you wanna find a thing, here are some things to look at. I call this a love audit. Look at your top common Google searches or YouTube search terms to see if there's a theme that emerges there. Or look at are there particular people that you follow on social media that inspire you and you love what they're doing. Look at all the books that you own. Is there a typical genre or theme? Is it filled with fantasy or self-help or creative narrative, right? And if you don't know what you love to do, look at whose work you admire. Look at someone who you love what they do and you're interested in learning how to do that, right? So look at all those themes and see if there's any overlaps that emerge and that can help you to answer this first question. Second question, what am I good at? Obviously there are some natural skills and talents that we all have, right? There are things that we are innately good at. Maybe you're a great listener or maybe you're really good at arranging outfits for friends, right? But also look at the things that you're good at in school. What classes do you typically get A's in, right? I know a lot of students coming to CCS excel in their art classes, right? Or what do your friends and family members always ask you to help with? If people are coming to you asking to design a logo for your school play or the t-shirt for an upcoming production or the background staging of a school play, that's somebody asking you for help with your creativity, right? Or think of the last few times you received praise or an award for something, right? What was that for? Right? I know a lot of students who come here receive awards for Scholastics or IHSAE, right? Um, so ask yourself, when was the last time someone complimented me or gave me praise or an award, right? Someone noticed what I did. That's probably because you're good at that thing. But obviously as high school students or younger students, you're, you're not perfect at everything yet, right? So another question to ask may be, what do you want to become better at? right? That may be a fitting question for where you are, right? Because you may be interested in interior design, but you've never had access to it. But that may be something you want to become good at, right? Or you want to work in video, but you've never had access to a video camera, right? Then that may be something you want to become better at. That's also an area of growth to look at um, is a good way of answering what am I good at or what do I want to become better at? Next, you want to ask yourself, what do you feel the world needs? And this is a very crucial one. This is the one people most commonly forget. There are a few ways to figure out what you feel the world needs. The first is to ask yourself this question. If I could change three things about the world or society, what would they be? Just only three things, right? Some people would change the way our political system works. Some people would change the way that we treat our environment. Some people would change the way that we interact with children and youth. Ask yourself, what three things would you change in the world? Another way of looking at this are what social causes are you passionate about or riled up about? What things do you get excited to share about and promote, right? I know some students care about LGBTQIA plus rights or about Black Lives Matter. What are you passionate about? Also, you can use your own personal experiences of adversity to figure out what, the, what you feel the world needs, right? Maybe you wanna solve a problem that you personally face so that others don't have to experience that. Speaking of that, Veronica Scott, who we saw a video of earlier, what she didn't mention in that video is that she grew up to drug addicted parents. She ended, uh, ended up in homeless shelters and situations at times. So that was an issue that was close to her heart and she wanted to impact other families and youth experiencing that. So her company is doing that, right? So maybe you wanna help others in a way that you've been helped. Another way of asking what you feel the world needs is 
Who do you find to be the most inspiring or inspirational people in your life? What difference are they making in the world? And do you want to make a similar difference in the world, right? Do you look up to MLK or Gandhi or, you know, uh, I don't know, Da Vinci, an artist, an inventor, right? Who do you look up and what difference, uh, who you look up to and what difference are they making in the world? And lastly, the one that trips up a lot of my creative folks is what can I get paid to do, right? I think a lot of artists falsely assume that what they love to do most won't make them money. So they don't pursue an art path, right? They don't pursue this career. They think of it as a hobby, right? But as you saw in the examples earlier, you can most certainly be paid to make a difference in the world with your creativity. I can't speak to every industry, but I know for sure if you're interested in art and design, you'll be happy to know that there are thousands upon thousands of ways that you can get paid as a creative, right? These are just the median salaries, right, for artists and designers making a livable wage, right? None of these people are starving artists with these salaries, right? This is the median. And this is back in 2018. The numbers are actually higher um, in 2019, right? So if you are looking for how to get paid, know that there is demand for creativity. It's the number one soft skill demanded by companies in the industry today, right? In the U.S. alone, there are nearly 700,000 businesses that employ millions of people, right? Artists and designers make up more than 2 million of those workers. We are not talking about starving artists. The arts, which includes design, contributes to more than $800 billion of the U.S. economy, right? And that's according to the National Endowment of the Arts. The arts actually employ more than the performing arts, so acting, singing, dancing, and the sports industries combined. There are more artists and designers out there working, right? Working artists and designers influence every facet of culture that we experience. Fashion accessories designers design the footwear, the shoes, the leather goods that we wear on a day-to-day -day basis. Product designers design and create the products that we use every day. Concept designers design the characters and the worlds that we see in movies and in video games. Directors, writers, visual effects artists and producers create the movies and TV shows we watch. Creative directors, copywriters, art directors that work on the commercials in between those shows that we watch and every other type of advertising that we see, right? They create online content, media and social media. They speak on behalf of brands, social causes, celebrities, political parties and more. Entertainment artists create the cartoons that we love and watch, the video games that we can't wait to play, right? Craftspeople, they create the objects that shift culture. They influence our everyday lives, but they also make jewelry, the textiles on our furniture, the furniture itself, right? And much, much more. Interior designers design the interiors of our hospitals, our airports, our schools, our offices, our places of work our vehicles and the commercial spaces we shop in. Trend forecasters and color material designers and artists influence the look and feel of every product that we buy. Communications designers, graphic designers, they design the logos we see, the packaging on everything we consume. Interaction designers influence every website we visit or app that we use. Transportation designers imagine and design the vehicles that get us around, whether they be cars, motorcycles, boats, jets, bikes, planes. They innovate the future of how we will move through autonomous vehicle design. Photographers shoot the images that we see on billboards and online and in magazines, whether it's commercial photography for the industry or documentary photography for the news outlets or fine art photography that we see in galleries and museums. And practicing studio artists, they make the art that causes us to stop and stare and be in awe, right? Illustrators, they make work that we not only see in museums, but the murals we see, right? They make the packaging, the graphic novels, the children's books that we love, right? Artists are curators, they're art historians, they're gallery owners, they're teachers. There are all different types of opportunities to work as an artist and designer. So when you want to know how to get paid to do something that you're creatively interested in, here are some ideas. First, look at the career or job pages of companies you admire. Here are a few of the companies where our alumni have gone on to work, a very small list of some of the companies, of the many, many companies our alum are at. If you have a college major that you're interested in, but you're not sure if it pays, just look up the salary ranges for the various jobs that graduates have from that specific major. For example, if you look at our interior design alumni stories on our website, you'll see the, the career name Color and Material Artist. Go and look up the salary ranges for those artists and see how much they're paid, right? There are some job examples from our graduates um, that I showed in this presentation, but there are so many uh, beyond this list here that you can find on our website and in our other materials. 
So as a student, it's pretty easy to know what you love and figure out what you feel the world needs. College is another great way, right, of pursuing your ikigai, of figuring out how to make all of these things combine, right? Like the stories that you saw earlier. But even before college, there are some ways to hone in your ideas, right? One of those is to just ask Google. You may discover that careers exist that already align with your ikigai that you may not have known of before. So I'll actually tell you an example from a student that I spoke with who entered a keyword from each of the four areas of her ikigai. She was obsessed with nail polish and posting on social media. That's what she loved. She was good at writing and liked making things coordinate. That's something people always ask her to help with, their fa her fashion sense. And she felt the world needed more beauty, right? And to figure out she can get paid to do that, all she had to work right was the word job. So she wrote in Google, nail polish, writing, job, beauty. She found out from that job that there's somebody who actually gets paid to name nail polish. And she Googled, who names nail polishes? She discovered that this is the job of a brand manager or copywriter who works in a cosmetic company. She then Googled, how much does that job pay? Brand managers earn on average $79,480 a year. That's a good salary, right? And she discovered what they do in that job, right? They manage product lines, they test products, they decide what products get to launch. Copywriters um, write the descriptions on all the products and the ads. They decide what packaging and the design of those packages should look like as a, a brand manager. And they also look after social media. They post on behalf of cosmetic companies, right? So she figured out what job she was interested in and there were several majors at CCS that can help her with that path. Our communications design major could help with that, right? Our uh, advertising design major could help with that, but also our creative writing concentration. So she knew exactly what she wanted to study when she was going to school and exactly where she wanted to take that into her career, right? Another way of figuring out how to pursue your ikigai is looking for mentors who are currently following their own ikigai. Ask them about their journey and what advice they'd give to someone following a similar path or interested in a similar path. And if you need access to illustrators, photographers, videographers, alumni from our school, we have a whole list of alumni who are eager to talk to high school students about your interest. Um, I recently had a student who was interested in working at uh, as an animator and was torn between whether she wanted to go to Cartoon Network or DreamWorks and I knew an alumni that she could talk to who works at Cartoon Network. And she was so thrilled and excited for her future after that conversation. She got some great insights and advice on how to pursue her ikigai. So if you're interested in that, we can definitely help with that. Also, high school counselors are a great resource for learning about opportunities to shadow, to learn more about a particular career path or colleges to consider. And the fact that you're here at Mini Portfolio uh, Week shows that you are already on that path, right? You're, you're utilizing the resources you have to figure out what options are out there. So I just want to uh, conclude with this. As you take the four things that you may be brainstorming to answer these four questions, if you want someone to talk through about these answers to further explore your ikigai and discover some career opportunities for you, CCS is a great resource to help you with this. If you feel that art or design is a big part of your ikigai, we're also a great opportunity to pursue that purpose, right? So we really encourage and invite you to reach out with your questions about career, alumni, hands-on opportunities to study on our campus. There are a lot of ways that we can really help to make sure you are growing your skill sets, elevating your passion, and knowing how to make a difference in the world and be compensated for your creative ideas. Because none of you who are here tuning in is born to be average. Each and every one of you have a unique gift that you can use to make a difference in the world. And if you are interested in taking your creativity to the next level, CCS is here to help, okay? So with that being said, I'd love to I'm going to turn on my camera here and see if there are any questions that I can answer for you all about pursuing your ikigai. Um, if you have any questions about some of the things that you were brainstorming as we were doing this workshop today, I'd love to, to answer those as well. So any questions? And one thing while I wait for questions to come in, I am going to paste in the chat box a link to our virtual admissions folder and it is full of amazing resources for you to learn more about our majors about alumni and to sign up for a counseling appointment if you want to talk more one-on-one about your ikigai 
Okay, I don't see any questions coming in. So with that, I want to say thank you so much for taking time to invest in your future, learn about your opportunities, and I hope you stay creative. Have a beautiful day and we'll see you at the rest of Mini Portfolio Week. Bye-bye.